All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on stream. Uh, before we get started today, I wanted to mention something that only just got brought to my attention, like literally when I got home from work today. So I have not had a time had time to even uh, address it myself at all. But um, one of the fellows, uh, Matt Masker, I don't even know how to pronounce his name, honestly, because on the he actually on the chat goes by Miblo, M M I B L O. Uh, so you've probably never seen this name before uh, on the chat because uh, it would not have come across as that. But Miblo, whose real name is Matt Moskarenhas, I don't know how you say it, um, started a Patreon uh, because he, 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 well, he needed the money and he does a lot of work on the Handmade Hero episode guide. Uh, just as a volunteer, he just like goes on there and uh, makes that. And if you don't know what that is, um, if you've never seen it, it's pretty amazing, actually, uh, for people who are trying to follow the series. If you go on here, you can go to the episode guide, uh, and it's got all the episodes on here, and then when you go to stuff uh, like this, it's got this crazy, like, uh, thing on the side that's, like, all the stuff that happened in that episode, you can, like, access it, right? Uh, and this is kind of amazingly good, because when you're trying to watch episodes, you know, you might not know, like, oh, I think there was a thing in this episode about blah, and it's like, oh, yeah, now I know exactly where it is. You can just click on it and go to it. So he's one of the main people who does those things, and he's done a ton of it. Uh, and so if that's something that you appreciate having, this episode guide, uh, he's one of the people who makes that happen, and he put up a Patreon. Uh, and so, you know, he definitely, he already does way more than $50 a month worth, work, worth of work on the episode guide, no question. I will be logging on immediately after this show uh, to make a pledge to this Patreon from the Handmade Hero Patreon because that is exactly the kind of thing that the Handmade Hero Patreon should be for, is supporting people who are doing this. Uh, and if you are someone who appreciates those episode guides and would like to contribute to this Patreon, um, uh, like I said, he already does way more work than this a month on those episode guides. So uh, I would highly recommend uh, kicking a few dollars his way uh, I know he could uh, use it and would really appreciate it. And like I said, he's one of the people who makes those episodes guides happen. Uh, they they don't just happen by accident. Someone's got to sit there uh, and actually look at the video and categorize everything we do into, into those times. And that's uh, just a lot of work. So check it out. Uh, it's pretty easy to get to. I think if you want to type it into your computer, you can actually, uh, yeah, you don't have to use whatever that is. So it's, it's literally just patreon.com slash miblo. Uh, we'll get you there. I think you can just... You can just do that, and that'll get you there. Uh, so, so check that out, and um, yeah, check that out, and consider su supporting it. All right, let's go ahead and start the episode. So, on Hand Me Hero right now, we're doing some user interface coding. We were doing some user interface coding because I thought it would be a good time to show how to do that kind of code. Uh, something that people are often very curious about uh, how you do it. So I was showing how to do it. Uh, and the reason I'm doing it uh, in the place we're doing it right now is because there's not a lot of reason to do user interface code for Handmade Hero um, because it's not really, you know, it's not a 4X game. There's not a lot of toolbars and not a lot of dialogue boxes or things like that in Handmade Hero. It's an action game. Uh, so what I'm doing is I'm taking the opportunity uh, to do some user interface code while we're doing our debug viewer. So basically like our thing that views debug information um, that is the thing that, that I'm, I'm sort of working on there. And we've gotten relatively far with it. Uh, we're at the point where we can do some pretty cool stuff with it. Uh, but uh, there's more to do. And so I want to kind of jump back in there to it. Uh, today's day 204. Again, this is uh, all coding today. So if you want to follow along at home and you have pre-ordered the game on handmadehero.org, you can follow along by unpacking day 203 source code into a directory. That's the source code that I'm starting with right now. So if you want to follow along at home, you should start with that uh, as your basis. Okay, so let's take a look here at where we are at. Uh, so here is our debug system, and here is it running. And uh, when we left it last, we kind of had this little thing in here where we, you know, we sort of had our, our little um, uh, our little test stuff. And we what we recently did is add the ability to have sort of uh, multiple versions of a hierarchy and track the state of them separately um, so that we can kind of, uh, you know, have, have more than one state of the hierarchy. So, you know, if we want to have just the renderer part out here or whatever, 
Uh, all of these are tracked as independent states. So when we are uh, accessing them, if we want it closed or you know on some and open on others, that's totally uh, allowed and, and uh, isn't at all a problem for our system. Uh, so basically what we did with the system was make it so that you know, we decouple the concept of the state of the hierarchy from the actual hierarchy itself uh, so that, you know, we don't have to worry about kind of like coupling the, the, the sort of interaction uh, with the thing that's being interacted with. And that's just something that I thought would be interesting to do, so we did it. Now, what I'd like to do today is I'd like to start, because we're getting relatively close here, I feel like, on our, our debug sort of hierarchy view, what I'd like to do is I'd like to start looking at the actual representation of the debug variables themselves, uh, because what I'd like to do is kind of make one more leap with the infrastructure, with the debug infrastructure, uh, to a place that I think is pretty important. Right now, what we're doing uh, is these hierarchies, the underlying uh, data for these hierarchies is explicitly constructed and explicitly exists all the time, right? Uh, what I mean by that is that if you are to look in the code, right, uh, where we've got we've got these sort of debug variable types and all that sort of thing. If you are to look in the code, you can actually see us construct right here the actual you know version of this hierarchy. We've constructed it and it exists in memory, right? And what that means is that anything that we want to edit right now has to actually exist in memory as a real debug hierarchy, right? That's explicitly constructed. Uh, as, a, as a thing, as a real, you know, living entity. And one of the problems with that is it makes it kind of annoying, potentially, and there's different ways that we can look, about, uh, look at this, but it makes it kind of annoying, potentially, for code that wants to use this to quickly expose debug variables to the system. Because now it's kind of a retained mode thing where anyone who wants to expose debug variables has to kind of go through the trouble of actually creating them and putting them somewhere. Now that's not a big deal for globals, because for globals it's the same, it's six of one, half dozen of the other. Because things like whether or not the ground chunk outlines are used is just a global switch that turns on and off, it doesn't really matter how we expose that. Because all it means is that whatever that Boolean is or however it's defined, we're just gonna make one of these things eventually and then forget about it. And it's something that the debug system can always use from then on and there's really no mystery to it. But what I'm a little more interested in is the more complex problem uh, of things where the game has stuff that it wants to expose and it doesn't necessarily want to do the work of creating an actual explicit debug tree for something uh, when it, you know, that thing may be kind of inconvenient. We don't want to like inject the, the you know, we don't want to force it to kind of uh, have to store things or manage things. We want it to just kind of work. Uh, and so what I'd like to do now is take a kind of a, a, a brief uh, sort of look at what we could do uh, in terms of making that sort of thing work a little bit better, right? And so the, the thing that we probably most want to be able to do in the game is we'd like to be able to do something like inspect uh, an entity, right? It would be nice to be able to inspect like what the values of an entity are, for example, because that's something that can be relatively difficult to do in the debugger because we don't really know what entity is what and it's kind of hard to like go, oh, I see, you know, there's an entity that's misbehaving over there. I wanna know why, like how do I see what the, what the state of it is? That's something that might be kind of a nice thing to add uh, to our system, right? So what I'd like to do today is start down that path and I'm gonna forget entirely about the debug code we've already written. And instead what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go do what I want to do to the entity code to make it possible to inspect those variables, right? Uh, and then I'm gonna go back to the debug system and make and, and unify those two, right? So this is, a, again, a very standard programming technique for me, it's something I do very often, which is if I know that there is a particular sort of uh, operation or task that I want a system to do, I will go write the usage code for that task, the thing that's going to use that system. I'll write that before writing the system uh, and then let that sort of dictate how the system works, right? And in this case, we've already done some of that because we did like kind of what we wanted for pound defines. But like I said, we've never really looked at this other use case. So I wanna write that use case and then let that drive how I upgrade this system to support it uh, rather than sort of 
changing the system in hopes that it will support that well and then going and using it and finding out that I was wrong, right? You might as well, if you know what you want to do, go do it uh, and let that inform how the system's written. It's a much more efficient way to make that work. Okay, so if we were going to do something like that, let's go over to handmade sim region. That's where we deal with our entities a lot. So I'm just going to kind of look in here uh, and see how we're doing that. And so you can kind of see as I go through this, this stuff, uh, when we, <clears throat> we've got kind of our begin sim, end sim situation. And when we do begin sim, we loop through all of the entities that are in the, the sort of the region that we're working on and we add them to the simulation. Right, you can see that happening here. And so if we do something like this, where we go through and we add entities to the simulation, uh, it's sort of an interesting question of, you know, maybe is that the right place for us to announce an entity or not? Uh, you know, it, it's kind of hard to say. Uh, but what I do know is that after we've added all these entities to the sim, we have sort of an easy way potentially now uh, to pick them. And so what I'd like to do is do something where I can <coughs> Ask the sim region, you know, using the mouse or something, I can go like click on an entity or something like that uh, and pick that entity. So now we know, you know, that, that you, you know, what that entity actually is in terms of like, you know, its entity ID or whatever, right? So just we know who it is. So that's what we're going to do today is the ability to like pick that entity uh, and take a look at how that might work. So inside the begin sim, when we do all this sort of stuff, when we add things uh, to the sim, you can see that what we do here is we, we kind of put them in like this. And then we have a sim entity collision volume group and that collision volume group tells us like the bounds of that entity, right? And that's really all we know about the boundaries of that entity for the most part. Um, <clears throat> at least if I remember correctly, I think that's all we know. We might have an extra thing in there which is like some kind of a radius, uh, but I don't actually remember. I think all we really have uh, is the collision stuff. And in fact, uh, when we do like move entity, right, I'm pretty sure when we do move entity that inserts things into uh, the set, right? Uh, something like that here. Uh, that kind of inserts things into the set specifically uh, by using that collision volume, I believe, right? Because uh, when we, right, uh, when we insert things, oh no, I guess that's not true. When we insert things, we don't actually care about their bounds. We just use their position and put them in that way, I think, right? I think that's actually the case. Uh, but we do know that at least for most entities, we will have that collision volume. So we could start with something like that and say that we'll just use the collision volume. We could also do something where we use just the position itself uh, and use the position uh, to pick, you know, so we could click near the position and do it. Uh, I'm not sure which of those would be the best way to go, but you know, uh, either way, either way we have some options, let's put it that way. Uh, so if I wanted to deal with something like that, uh, the first thing that I'd like to do is draw those collision volumes so that we can see them. Because uh, so far, as far, like, you know, if you take a look at what we've got drawn on here, right, um, I'm going to turn off the debug camera for now. Uh, if you look at what we've got drawn on here, we have kind of have this, uh, uh, this situation where, oh, you know what, I guess I've got room-based camera on as well. There we go. Uh, so we kind of have this situation where we don't actually see, you know, we've got entities and they have collisions, like I can't walk through, you know, this dude or whatever. Um, but we don't actually ever see what those collision volumes are, right? Like those collision volumes aren't actually drawn in any way. Uh, so what I'd like to do is just have some way of drawing those collision volumes onto the screen uh, in a way that I can actually perceive that, you know, uh, that I'd actually be able to, to sort of to see and look at. Uh, and in order to do that, I think we may have to introduce, you know, we might have to introduce something even like a line primitive or something because I'm not sure that there's really a lot of good ways to do it. I suppose we could do it with a rectangle, um, but it's a little bit tricky to even know how to do it exactly with the rectangle even because, well, both of the points of the rectangle would have to be projected and blah, blah, blah. So I'm not entirely sure, but let's take a look. So in the sim entity collision volume group, you can see we've got collision volumes and basically what they are is there's like an offset P and a dim, right? So it's basically like, oh, here's, you know, here's my, uh, my positioning, my placement for it relative to the entity's position. And then I've got sort of a dimension that says how big it is, right? Uh, and so if I kind of go into the renderer, uh, we don't really have anything that can do a rendering like that. 
uh, you know, we've got an ability to push a rectangle and we can push a rectangle at a 3D offset, but when we specify the dimension, the dimension is not specified um, in 3D in that way, it's specified in 2D, right? So we wouldn't actually even see what that, that rectangle really was. And so what we might wanna do, you know, one thing we could consider doing certainly is doing something where we actually have a rectangle call that makes a rectangle that, that takes like two points uh, in 3D and then fills the rectangle like around those points or something like that, right? Um, or something that takes, yeah, basically something that would allow us to, to more easily draw uh, those things. And push rect outline might be the better one for it too, uh, because push rect outline is, we probably don't wanna do solid blocks for our collision rectangles, probably just drawing the boundary uh, seems like maybe it's a little bit uh, more interesting, right? So let's just start off with something really easy. Let's start off with something where when we do the sim entities and, uh, and that stuff, uh, let's go into handmade.cpp. I think we've got a render loop here, right? You can see the render loop um, working its way through here. Uh, and so as we're going through these renderings, I feel like what we could do is at the end of this, right, if we wanted to, after everything, when we're uh, doing all these sort of push recs, what I could do at the very end of it is I could go through the collision volumes. In fact, right here you can even see us having done this before, right? Um, what I could do is say, all right, let's take this code for drawing the outlines of things and let's just do that for all the entities, right, uh, that there are. So even, no matter what entity it was, I'll just come down here and I'll draw uh, that, that uh, rect outline, right? Uh, so this should work for any of it, I think, for the most part. Oops, I don't know how that happened. How did that get in there? When did that get in there? I don't even know. Um, so yeah, point being, let's go grab that there. Uh, collision. Where did you go? Debug UI use space outline. So all I really want to do now is make one of these that's like, uh, you know, in our config file, for example. Uh, I want to do something where it's like, you know, draw entity outlines, something like that. Uh, and I don't know where that'll go, but we're going to put it in there. Let's take a look. I'm going to define that as one. Uh, and I'm going to go into our debug variables.h and I'm going to put that, where's that going to go? Uh, we don't really have anything. I guess we'll just have a new group. I don't know. Any of these? Something like that. And then we'll define one of them. Debug variable listing. Uh, draw entity outlines. Compile. So there are, you know, some entity outlines for the different entities, and you can kind of see that it's, it's roughly correct, right? And we're just using that uh, that same uh, code for it that we were using before. It's a little thick, I feel like, um, and I'm not sure. So the dim x y is just ignoring the z bounds. So that's how we were drawing it before, and you know that's probably fine. At the end of the day, uh, you know that's that's probably good enough for our purposes and all that. Um, I, I wish it was a little less thick. I do wonder perhaps if maybe our push rect outline, uh, does that actually support the ability to, to do a thickness? Um, it doesn't seem to. So we might wanna do something where we, you know, allow that to sort of get passed in like this uh, so that when we do a push rect outline uh, and we're showing these things uh, that, we're, that we're looking at here, we could also say, oh, you know what? Could you just, if you could just make that a little thinner that'd be great, right? Uh, and so there's those, those lovely, they are really pretty beautiful. There's a nice magenta outline there, right? All good. It's pretty good, pretty good. Uh, so now we can kind of see those boundaries on the screen. Uh, and so now what I wanna do is make it so that we can actually pick with the mouse one of those boundaries. So that when we're moving the mouse on the screen, uh, around, like we can click on one and say, I wanna highlight this entity, right? Like this is the entity that I wanna select, if that makes sense, right? All right, so if I wanted to pick one of those guys, if I wanted to like make sure that I could, you know, could do that, really all I need to do is be able to see whether my mouse cursor 
is inside one of those rectangles, just like we were doing before, right? We could, we could easily do that. The problem is, remember, we have a transform on our view here. We like, I mean, right? To, to, to put a fine point, to put not too fine a point on it, as I might say, uh, I can change, like, for example, this to use the debug camera and everything like shrinks down, right? So obviously there is not just some canonical like coordinate system that this is all in at render time. It's actually taking the world and it's like taking where the camera is and it's producing where all of the entities are through a projection like we talked about. So in order for my mouse to know what it is over, in order for me to figure out what the mouse is over in the, in the actual game world, we need to basically do an inversion, right? We need to reverse the process that the renderer is going through that's taking things from the world and putting them on the screen because the mouse is on the screen and we need to reverse it to put it into the world. Does that make sense? Uh, and we didn't have to do that for hit testing uh, for our debug UI because the debug UI is not in the game world, right? When we scale the game world, there's no transform on the debug UI. It's just one-to-one -one pixels, right? So the pixels, the, the mouse cursor, where the mouse cursor is in pixels and where these things are in pixels is the same thing, right? So it's all in the same space and it just works. But if we wanted to hit test these things on the screen, because they're going through that camera transform, which again is something we can set and control and change, then we're going to have to have some way of reversing it, right? Uh, and I think, I, I almost want to say, I don't remember if this is, if this is the case or not. I want to say we sort of started this process for a different reason um, I think yeah right here right so we have unproject let's see here I want to see where that's being called so we have unproject uh, and we're using that well we're not using it at all so we have unproject which is just a way of taking um, something that's in the uh, I guess it's it's not really a, a 2d location ah no we are using it okay there it is <clears throat> get camera rectangle at distance right so what we're doing there is essentially we're saying okay we would like to take uh, whatever our um, monitor is right whatever we know the monitor dimension is we want to unproject that uh, so that we know how what the camera can see right so that we did have a good reason for it so we already have the ability to unproject something so if we want we could run this projected XY function on our mouse coordinates and in theory we'll get back right what that position in the world would be now as you know or I shouldn't even necessarily say as you know uh, but I'll, I'll draw it out just in case it's it's not clear. If I was to talk about the position of the mouse on the screen, uh, and let's just draw this again. So here's here's the focal point, right? Um, and you know we're talking about something out in the world here. Like here's the tree, right? And this is the monitor. And as you know, when we do our projections, like we take some point on the tree, we project it onto the screen, right? And this, this tree, the whole tree point at a time gets kind of projected onto there. If you think about it that way, if you thought about all the points on the tree, they all have sort of lines that intersect the monitor. That's where we're sort of talking about uh, them being. Now, if we want to do the inverse of this, if we have a point here and we go, where in the world is it? Well, what you can immediately see is there isn't a single point in the world that corresponds to a single point on the screen. It's actually a family of points along a line, right? Anything along this line from the focal point to the point on the screen and out into the world, anything along that line is going to map to the same point on the screen, right? So that's why we need one additional value, which is the distance from the camera that we want it to be. So if the camera's here, right? Um, and, uh, and that's where we're sort of looking along. And this is the point on the screen. What we need to know is what's the total distance this way? Like what's the total distance along that line, right? Um, 
not along that line, I shouldn't say. What's the total distance like for this plane? If this plane was to be pushed back, right? What's the total distance from the camera to the actual plane we're talking about? And then it will find that piece, right? And we know what that is. We know what that is because that's the camera. Uh, that's, that's what the actual uh, ground like distance is. So when we're picking, uh, we, could, we could just use how far away that is. But Uh, it does get a little more complicated than that in some sense, if we want to think about it, think it through a little bit more uh, deeply, right? So the other thing we could think about, the other way to sort of conceptualize this, is when we are picking something, we don't necessarily know what plane we might want to be picking, right? Because when we look at things, you know, if we had some things stacked on top of each other, so back here there's, you know, more trees in the distance or something, so it draws like in there, we might want to have it so that as we are looking through these entities, we are taking like whichever one's close to the camera, or maybe we want to know all of the entities that intersect it um, and select all the things that are, that are under the mouse cursor because there's going to be more than one, right? And so another way to think of it would be to say, well, when we're picking, we're really just talking about maybe like this line. We're talking about we want to know what the entities are that intersect this line, right? And that's a slightly more advanced way to think about it. And it's a way that's a little bit more complicated to program because then what you have to do is when you look through uh, entities, you kind of have to go like, would they, uh, you know, where are they relative to the camera, do the intersection, and then go, okay, is, would that intersection have been the closest one or whatever. But it's still not particularly onerous for us to do. Uh, so I think that's probably what I will just go ahead and implement, right? And so our goal for today uh, is to make it so that as I move this mouse around, I want to, to basically like change this color, um, right, this color here. I want to change this color to let's say yellow whenever I am over an entity so that I can see that I'm like picking them correctly, if that makes sense. Uh, so in order to do that, I should be able to do something fairly straightforward like doing unproject. We'll try this first. Uh, so I'm going to go here and say, you know, is highlighted equals false, or maybe I'll just even go v4 outline color, right, equals that lovely magenta. And then I'll say like if some stuff is true, uh, we'll have outline color equal to uh, like a lovely yellow instead. So what I want to do here is I'm going to unproject the mouse, and I'm going to unproject the mouse for the render group that we're using, and I'm going to take whatever the mouse p is here, right, uh, and then I'm, and we got to make sure that that's in our reasonable coordinate system, obviously. So we're going to have to take a look at that, uh, sort of in a second. Uh, but anyway, we've got a mouse P there, and then we've got distance from camera. And what we want to do for distance of camera is we want to take however far the entity is away. So we're going to look at how far it is on its plane of existence, right? Uh, so I'm going to take a look at like the entities. Uh, uh, total position in space, right? Uh, and again, that's going to be relative to the camera already, because everything in this, in this uh, case is, going, is, is represented relative to the camera. Now, the only problem is something I don't actually remember about the way we were doing this is I don't actually remember what we set up for the camera point per se. But you can see here that if this is what we're actually passing, then we must have set up the camera correctly originally. Uh, we're setting the ground point here. So I'm just going to take whatever we're doing there, that, that offset P. I'm going to assume that that's the picking plane that we want to be in for now. right? Uh, so I'm just going to say that this, oops, the Z of this is what we want. OK. Uh, and so then I'm going to say, well, okay, after I unproject this thing, uh, this is my like uh, local mouse P or whatever, then I can just sort of say, well, whatever I was going to draw, right, uh, for my, for my um, collision volume here, right, uh, I've got some, uh, some 2D volume that I'm sort of projecting here for my push rect outline. Uh, I should be able to take whatever that uh, rectangle is 
and, uh, and, and see whether I collide with it, right? So if I take this dim xy, and I assume this dim xy is centered around the collision volume, and I could do this per collision volume. In fact, I could do this whole thing per collision volume if I want to. I guess I could say I could do it in here like this. And I should probably actually make sure I use that outline color. Uh, right, so you can see here I've got the volume um, offset P. So I could just use that volume offset P and say, okay, for the particular volume, whatever its Z is at, I'm gonna unproject that. And then I'm gonna see uh, whether this uh, thing is, is inside uh, the rectangle sort of defined by this dimension, right? Uh, and I guess actually I could also do it just by checking the, well, I'm not gonna bother. Uh, yeah, if that's the local mouse P, that's the one that's like, you know, in the same space as our entity basically. So what I should be able to do there is say, um, you know, I've got the volumes dimension. So I could just say, okay, if the local mouse P, uh, the volumes dimension, you know, X and the volumes offset P, uh, you know what, I could even make this a little simpler. After unprojecting it, I could even just make it relative to the offset P, right? So basically what I'm doing here is saying, okay, let's find out relative to the center of this, um, this uh, collision volume, where is the local mouse? Once I know where that is, I can just say, okay, if the local mouse piece X um, is greater than like uh, the negative dimension, actually now that I think about it, how are we drawing this? This is like a center half dim thing, right? Pretty sure, yeah. Uh, so if it's, if it's you know, uh, greater than half the dimension, uh, and less than half the dimension, right? And then I do the same thing with y, like so. Uh, I now know exactly what's, uh, you, you know, whether or not this thing is inside or outside uh, that 2D uh, volume. And this is not a full 3D test against the volume, but that's probably okay for our purposes. Like I said, if we want to be a little more ridiculous about it, we could do ray intersects 3D cube a 3D, you know, right rectangular prism. Uh, but there's really no need for that for the debug picking, certainly. So probably seems like that would be a bit of a waste of time, to say the least. But, uh, so let's go ahead and, oops, got to dereference that above where I use it, certainly. Uh, so let's go ahead and, and see if we can make our mouse P here. Oh, look at that. We're still controlling the music volume. <laughs> That's probably not what we want for now. Uh, so we've got the input mouse X and the input mouse Y. But uh, those again are sort of what the, what the system tells us where the mouse X, uh, where the mouse is and so on. And so since, you know, rather than try to always remember exactly where the system thinks the mouse is, what I'd like to do also to start is I'd like to do a push rect of the mouse's location so we can see what we think it actually is, right? Uh, and so what I can do there is temporarily, you know, again, without actually, um, uh, without actually having to do uh, anything too fancy here, I should be able to take some of the places where we're rendering stuff, uh, which is after the controller stuff happens. So when we start doing this here, uh, like this stuff here, right? When we've got this perspective transform, after I unproject the mouse, I could show where it's, I'd like to show prior to projecting as well where it is. Um, so I'd have to think, I guess I'd have to make an orthographic projection first, uh, but that's not really a big, a big deal, right? So what I could do is right here, um, where we've got this sort of stuff, what I could do is do an orthographic beforehand just to draw the mouse, right? Because in here, you know, we already did, did that, right? We did this. Uh, so if I wanted to, I could do uh, do one of these. I don't actually remember what this 1.0 thing is. I think that's just the scale factor, right? Uh, so if I did that, now I could actually draw wherever the mouse is. So I could just say, okay, there's a mouse P, right? That's the input. Mouse X, the input, mouse Y. And once I have that, I can do a push rect outline if I want to. Uh, now, 
Again, I should probably also move the clear up a bit, right? The clear should happen before all this. Uh, but I don't actually, the clear, I don't remember if that clears the whole surface or just this part of it. Uh, but yeah, I guess I can do it this way. That's probably fine. Uh, so when I clear this thing, uh, after I do the input mass x, mass y, uh, I can then push a rectangle on here. And if I do push rect outline, there we go, uh, I should be able to see where the mouse actually is uh, before we do anything with it, right? Uh, so if we just go ahead and, and make one of these guys, uh, and then we have the dimension of it, I don't know, which will just be like a two by two thing. Uh, that should show us where we, we think the mouse cursor is before we try to do anything uh, more fancy than that. All right. Um, oh, well, and you know what? I probably need to draw that after because I saw it there. It actually worked, uh, but uh, gonna have to do that afterwards. So this should probably uh, as well be kind of down at the bottom uh, after we do everything else so we can actually see it. All right, uh, mouse P. Of course, mouse P itself can certainly be something that we do early. Uh, that's all fine. Uh, okay. So let's see if this works now. Uh, mouse P. And you know, the other thing that I'd have to do is reset uh, the render transform, the offset P. Uh, this guy, render group transform. Uh, and I don't remember if we have some way of setting the render transform to the identity. Uh, I don't actually remember if that's something we did. Uh, let's let's take a look. I feel like that's something we would want, certainly. Perspective, orthographic, and you can see that those like don't get set, right? Like the offset P doesn't get set here. And I wonder if they sh probably should clear it, you would think. Um, I feel like they kind of should. Because if you look at what is in the transform, it's got the offset P and the scale, and those don't get t touched by these, but I kind of feel like they should, right? I feel like that's something where you kind of want uh, those to be set. Maybe I'm wrong about that, but it just kind of feels like what it should be to me. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, you can see our little mouse is there now. So now I've at least verified that it's accurate, which is what I wanted, right? Um, but I think that also I don't actually know, uh, like I was saying, in the orthographic mode, I don't actually know that I'm interpreting that mouse right in a way that, you know, I don't know if that's actually in the projected space screen or not. I'm not sure. Uh, so I want to take a look at the, those values. So for example, um, when it's up here, right? Uh, I'd like to know what it actually is. Like what's the actual value uh, when it's up here. So like right now, for example, what I might do is uh, just break into the code somewhere. Doesn't matter where, game update and render. Uh, and I wanna see what mouse P is set to, right? I just wanna see what, what it, oops, what it ends up being. Uh, and I want to actually search for it if possible. Find and Click find mouse P, here we go. And so what's the value? So the X value is negative 934 and the Y value is 511. So it looks like they, the, the coordinate system for the mouse is in fact uh, the screen coordinate system, right? Uh, so that seems to me uh, to be totally reasonable, right? So now what I'd like to do is step it up one notch. I'd like to go ahead and say uh, that when we are doing these debug entity outlines, I'd like to now also draw uh, sort of the, um, the local P, right? I'd like to, did that actually save? The, I, hate, I hate it when Visual Studio saves my file. I wish you could turn Visual Studio to never save anything to just only be in, in debugger, not an editor, would be nice. Uh, so when I loop over these volumes and I do this local mouse P and I unproject the thing back into the world, what I wanna do now 
is I want to be able to draw that mouse P as well. So where, whatever that local version is. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so I want to basically say like, okay, once I've unprojected it, I should be able to draw it again after I compute um, where it is. I should be able to say, okay, I've got the local mouse P. Uh, and if I were to turn that into a 3D thing using again, the sort of uh, the Z value. So, you know, uh, something like local Z, that's my local Z value. Assuming that I was to draw it, where would it be? Uh, and I'm going to draw that as a bigger one here. I'm going to draw that uh, as, you know, something that I can, can tell what it is. So maybe like uh, 1.0 or 0, 0, 0, 0, just a nice cyan there. Something like that. Um, and then I want to look and see if I can see that. And if I can see that, like where it even is. Right, and I'm not seeing it anywhere. No, that should have been that should be happening for like every entity, right? And I'm not seeing it at all. So I'm obviously thinking about this slightly wrong. I'm not uh, I'm not properly uh, doing what I should be doing here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, so something's amiss, and I'm not sure what. I'm looping through the volumes. I'm using whatever the volume Z is as the reverse projector. I'm taking whatever the X and Y is of the volume and I'm subtracting it away. So this should be local to the entities, like roughly local to the entities P. It's not quite because it's the volumes P, but even so, it should be pretty close. Uh, and so I should see something nearby to the cursor when I'm over an entity. Uh, and that is definitely not happening. Uh, so I would like to know why that's not happening. Um, let me take another quick look down here, just so I make sure I know what I'm actually debugging. So the way that we worked that out is we take the distance from camera, we divide the f by the focal length, and we multiply that uh, by the projected x, y uh, by that value. And so in theory, yeah, that would make it, uh... so that I think, just thinking that through a little bit, right? That I think actually doesn't go to pixels is our problem, right? Like if we look at what actually happens there, that's not gonna actually get us to pixels. Looking at our get entity, uh, our basis P, right? Looking at get render entity basis P, when we do our transform here, you can sort of see uh, that after we do that projection, which you can see us doing right here, after we do our projected XY, we do a transform of meters to pixels. And so I feel like that meters to pixels uh, is the problem. You can see us unprojecting monitor half dim in meters here. So we would first need to when we do this unproject, we would first need to unproject it like using the meters to pixel value, right? So, I mean, I just for right now, I mean, I could sort of do that directly. We have this mouse P, the local Z is already in meters. The mouse P is, is not. So we have meters to pixels, right? Uh, so what we could do is take pixels to meters and multiply it. Uh, and then we could go ahead and, uh, oops. And then we'd be go we'd be going uh, ahead and doing the uh, the conversion there. Now it looks like uh, meters to pixels. It looks like we never actually did that one. We only have uh, meters to pixels, not pixels to meters. Uh, but that's okay. I can divide by it as well. That's totally fine. Or I should say, multiply it by the inverse. Um, meters to pixels. 
It's not? Oh, it's a property of the transform. Sorry. My bad. Okay. Um, oh my. I can't say I know what's going on there. Push rect act line, local mouse P. Is that, oh, that's actually these. All right, well, yeah. Forgot about the fact that this would actually get scaled up. That's my bad. Uh, yeah, so probably wanna cut that down quite a bit. Uh, yeah, because that's now in, that's in meters. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well we're getting there though. Uh, we are getting there. And looks like, oddly enough, we're kind of either all in or all out on some of these. So like we're kind of, we're, we're still a little bit janky, but we're getting there, right? Like you can see that no matter what the mouse is, I'm sort of not actually, these are not actually offsetting relative to each other. They're offsetting uh, relative to they're, they're basically all at the same offset, but it should be different per individual uh, bounding element. But we're getting closer. Uh, so <clears throat> now that I've corrected uh, for the pixels to meters, and I'm looking at unprojecting uh, that mouse P there, after I do the unproject and then I center it around this particular collision volume, ah, and there's yet another problem. So when I am doing the, the offset p uh, dot x, y, right, and the offset p dot z, these are, that's not actually where the thing is, right? It's, it's actually going to be relative to the entity itself as well, right? So first we would have to put the mouse relative to the entity before going any further. So this Right, and we can do this first, right? We can do something like this where we've got, you know, like um, uh, meters mouse P, right? When we've got mouse in meters, what we then want to do is make it relative to the entity here. Um, so meters mouse P, uh, we want all the rest of this stuff to happen relative to the entity. Uh, so when we do this unproject, this local Z is actually not the correct local Z. Um, Right, it's be because this meters mouse p that local z needs to actually include uh, whatever the entity's p was as well, uh, and of course unproject since it uses the transform, which has been set for this entity, that will actually work because it gets included in there, right? But this subtract, which is not going through there, won't, and that's a little bit subtle, but just so I'll just reinforce it. Unproject uses the transform, and the transform here was already set up to be relative to the entity. So anything that we draw or call the render system for is already entity relative, right? But this piece of math is not entity relative. This is using the volumes offset p, but what it really should be doing is being uh, using the entities p, right? It needs to take into account this thing right here, this entity, get entity ground point. It needs to know that right because that's what's actually getting used uh, so it needs the volumes p and it also needs uh, it also needs the entities uh, transform as well so it needs both of those things uh, to take take into account both of those things right then it will actually be local like relative to it uh, and I think actually that might have been most of the bug uh, entirely possible anyway a little closer so those are still those are now much too conservative uh, so let's see here we've got our meters mass P uh, which was converted from meters to pixels which is what we wanted um, because that would be multiplying by pixels to meters which is exactly what we want to do uh, we unproject it which is what we want using the Z uh, that's relative. Mm. 
that all looks fine to me. Uh, we then subtract uh, whatever the transforms offset uh, was plus the volumes offset, uh, and we go ahead and draw that on there. That seems pretty reasonable to me, I guess. Since it is a perspective projection though, technically we're not really doing this in the correct uh, order there, because then after we do that back projection, well, no, that, that should actually be, I think that should actually be okay. That still, that seems like it should actually be correct. But anyway, you can see why I am already thinking it's not correct though, right? Is because as I'm moving, these, all these things we're drawing are where the, it thinks the mouse is relative to some entity. And so what we should be seeing, right, is we should always be seeing those guys line up with uh, the mouse cursor, right? They should always be lined up with the mouse cursor. Uh, and if they're not, then it's just erroneous, right? So, you know, the other thing I can do is uh, I could do something like this as well. This right here, since I have an entity index, I could just pick one entity, right? Like so. Not sure which entity we want, uh, but we'll figure that out in a second here. So if I run this, uh, we'll pick an entity, maybe get one of them trees. Do you see it? There it is. Um, so now we're drawing where we think the mouse is relative to this guy. And you can just see that that's like totally, like that is just very nonsensical, right? It's, it's not at all in the correct place. Now, it's not even the correct scale. So like I said, we've got kind of a couple things that are, there's still something a little bit amiss, if you will, uh, about how this is happening. Uh, but like I said, I kind of wanted to do, this is a fairly standard debugging thing, right? I kind of wanted to reduce the number of cases I'm looking at here, just so I can get a, a little bit better idea what's going on. So just by dropping it down to a single entity, I don't have to sort of think about everything at once that's being drawn on the screen. So here we are. Uh, we've got meters mouse p, and after I unproject that, uh, I'm kind of interested to know after unprojecting, right? Uh, I'm kind of interested to know if I just unproject it, uh, what does it look like then? If I don't do the subtract, uh, I kind of want to know, I'm just for educational purposes, I want to see what it looks like if I don't. Uh, correct it, right? And so there you can kind of see not correcting it uh, surprisingly makes it in the in the right place. And I'm wondering, does unproject take into account this? It doesn't. See, unproject never takes into account where things are. So I'm a little weirded out of why I don't have to do this subtract. The subtract should have to happen. Very peculiar, very, very peculiar. I guess that makes some sense though, because if you think about it, it's always gonna draw relative to the entity because that's what it's programmed to do, right? It's using that as its transform. So that's not that surprising. And so anything that you moved around the center of the screen, you know, if it was, but, but, even so, Okay, no, so there it is. So it is around the center of the screen. Okay, so that's totally fine. I'm just watching its motion, right? So if I circle it like this, I should see it kind of move, you know, relative to the square towards the mouse cursor, and I'm not seeing that. So that's what I wanna be able to do, right? Yeah, that seems a little bit more like it. I was gonna say, you should have to do that. Uh, so when I do this on project, and I take it back uh, to the with the local Z like that. I feel like at distance from camera. So I feel like if I look at what's going on here, I feel like maybe our unproject is just kind of fundamentally busted. Because if you look at what it's doing, it's never taking into account the actual offset P. It's as if the offset P doesn't exist, 
right? So really, this local Z really should actually contain the entirety of this transform, right? It should actually have this in it, which is kind of dumb. I feel like that's not so good, uh, the way that works, because you'd feel like unpro unproject uh, should probably take that into account. Um, but anyway, so that's probably more correct, uh, I think. Uh, when we do that, it should have that transform, that offset P, uh, Z in there. And then, you know, b both of those have that. The local Z has that, right? Um, so I'm pretty sure that's that's more correct. Uh, so the at distance from camera, again, is, uh, yeah, just, I mean, that seems pretty clear to me. So the at distance from camera uh, should include the full uh, Z of the object, whatever that is. And then the, uh, I'm pretty certain that should give us the correct scaling. And so I'm not sure, the thing that, that's kind of weird is why it's not giving us the correct scaling. I guess, uh, so after we do this, this unproject local Z, that's the tricky part, is this push rect will actually use that. So it's actually only the volume Z, yeah, this is just nasty, uh, that you would use there. This is why I think our unproject needs to be more symmetric. It's just, it's simply a little too crazy at that point. Yeah. Uh, but that's still not scaled properly and I'm not sure why, uh, right? Because I feel like it should be scaled. It should be moving with the mouse properly. Uh, so unless I'm doing something wrong with the meters mouse P here, where I'm doing something incorrect, where I'm, I'm not properly uh, preparing it uh, uh, with meters to pixels. And I can double check, like uh, we're just trying to do the inverse remember, of our um, get entity basis p. That makes sense. Uh, render basis p. What's the, what's the function called? There it is. Uh, so yeah, you can kind of see what's basically going on here, right? So we're just trying to undo this. So we multiply meters to pixels times the projected x, y to get the location of it. Um, we can ignore these, pr probably this uh, result scale offset z, that's like the y offset for z. Um, but you can see here, we've got sort of the screen center and then we've got that, that projected y. Now, that should be it, right? I mean, that should be pretty much the whole thing. You can see this projected x, y distance to p, z thing. Um, that distance to PZ is just the distance above target. Um, so yeah, that, that all seems pretty reasonable. That all seems pretty reasonable to me. So you can see here, right, the transform meters to pixels the projected x, y, z there, right? Whatever the z is. That z value is what the scale would be. That's how much the mouse should be moving. So again, I feel like one over meters to pixels uh, should have done it. And I'm not sure why it doesn't. I feel like we're probably gonna run out of time here. I don't know when I started, but it's probably like 610. I feel like this requires a little more careful consideration. Also, I feel like, like I said, I feel like we want this function to be more symmetric. I feel like we want to exactly undo this transform. Um, and we're not quite doing that at the moment, right? Uh, because if you were to take a look at what this is doing, if you just look at just this, um, like so, uh, we're talking about this equation. And so if we've got transform meters to pixels projected x, y, like so, we want to undo this operation. Uh, and this is, right, that. So if what we want to do is we want to get raw x, y out of here, that's what we're trying to do. Uh, we, you know, because we want to do the inverse. We've got this, you know, we've got uh, projected, we've got, we've got result, right? and we want to get this. Solving this equation, right, is going to do, you're going to divide by this to get that 
out of there, right? Oops. That was not a very good cut and paste. Right, so get that out of there. And then you're just left with this. Yeah. And then, if I just actually just get rid of these two guys. Uh, and then, uh, we want to solve for row xy, so we would move um, this guy over, right? So we'd also be dividing by this which I think moves this guy to the top, right? Yeah. Uh, and then the focal length, again, also, oops. Yeah, the focal length is also gonna get uh, divided out. So it's something like that. So it's just addition to PZ times result uh, over the focal length and I'm pretty sure that's basically exactly what we had. The only difference is we left out the meters to pixels, right? Uh, so there's that distance to PZ, right? Um, yeah, uh, so there's that distance to PZ on the top. There's the focal length on the bottom. There's the result. So that, that is exactly what we do. The only difference is we left out meters to pixels. So in theory, it just feels like if you get that back and you divide by meters to pixels, that should have done the inverse. Uh, so there's obviously something I said stupid that I'm just not um, picking up on because that does look like the inverse. And although I don't like the, s the symmetry of it, I'd rather just debug this as it stands before making that modification. Um, but, you know, uh, again, dividing that meters to pixels, I guess the thing is, you do the divide by meters to pixels kind of at the end of that. It shouldn't matter when you do it because it's linear. Um, so I don't feel like that should matter at all. So that should be the, the right thing, I think. Uh, but obviously it's not because if it was, this would be working and it is not working. And so, yeah, we'll have to test it more thoroughly tomorrow, I guess. Very strange. I don't really want to stop debugging this. I want to kind of go actually finish it because I feel like I, I never like not knowing why something's doing what it's doing. And these kinds of, the, this kind of code is always very finicky because you can't see it very effectively. One of the reasons I kind of want debug diagramming in our system as well. Um, but yeah, it's just one of those things where it's like, there's something simple going on here that's not clear uh, about what exactly is not being reversible. And I don't like leaving something like that because it ends up bugging me. But I can't think of anything in shorthand, so I feel like I'm just gonna have to. Because otherwise, yeah, I mean, we could we could be here for another hour of me looking at it and, and going through each individual part and, and verifying it and so on. Uh, so that's probably just better, something better done for tomorrow. Uh, so let me see. So let's think here. Offset P minus the dim Z volume dim X Y outline color. So that's just kind of that all assumes the centering around. So that that all looks like again, looks exactly like what I would expect. The meters mouse P looks exactly like what I would expect, right? Divides by the meters to pixels for the transform, uh, which seems totally reasonable. And um, the local Z I guess one thing I don't know is if distance from camera is supposed to be positive or negative there. But that wouldn't expect it affect the scale. It would only affect the direction of movement. It would be flipped, right? And if I unproject with the render group that I'm on now, I pass the meters mouse P and the local Z, that should give me a point in the world uh, that is where 
that mouse was, relatively speaking. Yeah, I don't know. There's something scale, scale, wrong scaling-wise about what we're doing, but I don't know what it is. Are we sure we don't know? On what order is the actual lack of scale? Like how far away from being correct is that? Like for, for starters, it's, it's not centered around the correct thing, right? Um, but the scale itself being wrong is kind of interesting. So let me try something here. I'm just gonna try something a little bit, uh, a little bit crazy. Right. So in here, when we're always offsetting around the ground entity point, like we were doing before, right? I'm gonna tr I'm gonna just see what happens if instead of doing that, uh, we were to just go ahead and like, uh, you know, like say, okay, the render group transform offset p is gonna be set back to zero. So now all of the drawing is going to happen relative to just the regular old world. And so when I do this uh, stuff here, uh, in fact, what I could do is I could draw the mouse. I could even stop doing this. I could just debug that mouse transform by itself, right? I could just say, oh, OK, I'm going to do exactly what I was doing before, where I take a local mouse p. I do it on project, but I'm just going to make up a Z value, whatever it is, it's 10 meters away from the mouse, let's say. So at 10 meters away from the mouse, and again, we can also do this the same, right? So we clear off that transform. We say at 10 meters away from the mouse, um, where would it be? And then we just draw that. Uh, we draw that world mouse be at 10 meters off, out. And that should, uh, again, if we reproject it using the same local Z, uh, we, should, we should see it right on top of our cursor. Uh, and we're assuming that our transform function is broken, so we won't see it. Yeah, and we don't, right? Uh, I'm going to set the debug camera out a little bit just to see. where that draws. See, I don't even see that at all. How is that possible? Why am I not seeing anything? But that makes it pretty easy. We can just step in and see what's going on here, right? I guess we should also set the scale to one, just to be sure. But, I mean, that should not affect it, right? Um, all right, so let's see what's going on here. We do meters to pixels. We do the unproject with uh, 10 meters as the distance. I suppose, yeah, I don't see anything for there. So it's not some weird thing about it being behind the camera. So let's figure out why this is not working. Ah, well, that would probably do, do it a little bit. Okay, so there we go. So looking at that, uh, you can kind of see that it's okay, but not great. It's not really tracking the mouse. It's sort of where the mouse is, but not really. So something's wrong with that. And let's see what happens if I change the local Z to one. Yeah, so it's really just totally wrong because what should be happening when we do that unproject is it should be scale invariant. No matter what local Z, whatever Z we pass here, as long as we pass the same Z here, the unproject and the reproject should put it back in the same place. And the fact that that's not happening means it's obviously wrong. Like that's just, that's just flat out bad, right? 
So that local Z, uh, that local Z, no matter what we set it to, we should get the same results and we're not. Uh, so let's look at it one more time and, and see what, what am I doing wrong there that's causing that problem because that is definitely not correct, right? Uh, so we've got transform distance above target and then we're saying the distance to PZ is the distance above target minus whatever the Z value is. So that alone, that alone could be our problem. We are not accounting for that at all, right? So the distance from camera in that unproject is not really, that was a little too purpose built. That looks like almost the entirety of the problem to me. Yeah. That's the problem. So when we're passing this Z, right, that Z value, yeah, okay, so this Z value actually first, and you can see that, um, where is that? Uh, there, we had it, uh, just, render entity basis p uh, the fact that z actually looks like that distance above target uh, minus pz that is actually probably our problem right it's happening here but it's not going to happen in unproject so really what we would need to do is after we unproject this thing we would need uh, to take uh, that value that we get back, right? And we need the local Z, instead of being 1.0, when we actually pass this in, it would actually, you know, the local Z that we're talking about would actually have to be like the reverse of that. So it would have to be, it would have to take transform distance above target, right? Uh, and it would have to like have it be, you know, uh, it would, it would have to put that in there like like this, if I'm not mistaken, right? It would need to be, it would need to have this be subtracted out. Uh, oh, and I guess more like that because it's going to automatically subtract out distance from target and just be left with PZ. I think that's correct. Um, but yeah, that's just something we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to re-architect the way that works a little bit because uh, that's just complete garbage. We want our, our two things to be symmetric there, right? Um, and so I'm not even sure exact. We have to get it to undo so that once it is pushed through here, it's going to equal the total distance speed that local Z is. So basically we have to make this equation come out to be local Z, right? Um, so we need uh, to make, you know, whatever foo is, um, like this, uh, we need to make sure that distance above target, this this whole thing comes out to be local Z is what we actually need, right? Uh, so foo should be equal to local Z plus, uh, nope, I take it back. It's uh, minus distance above target, right? Uh, and so then you that's the negative foo, so the positive foo would be distance above target minus local Z. So this is actually, I guess, what the thing would be to correctly reverse that transform, if I'm not mistaken, I think. Did that actually compile? Yes. OK. So I think that should have done it, although it doesn't look, again, still not quite right. But that's definitely, like, that's, that's definitely uh, a big part of our issue there, in the sense that there's no Yeah. So I think what we really want to do is just actually reverse this transform properly. And of course, we do have a slight problem where we're going to have to think about what that means for actually the way we were using unproject before. Uh, but basically, I want to take this whole thing, right, uh, and make this a little bit more uh, specific, right? So if we were to do a complete unproject, so let's say I went down here and we've got unproject as it currently stands. 
if we were to do a complete unproject, we need to do one that actually takes into account all of these things, right? So the first thing would be, uh, we would probably want to do this if transformer of the graphic thing, honestly, right? Uh, we'd probably want to do these so that we can do both branches, right? We don't want to use the debug camera ever because we probably want that to keep uh, its sort of its thing going on. Uh, although we could actually, we could maybe, uh, I don't know, I don't know which, it depends on which kind of unproject we wanted to be doing, but, uh, so anyway, so what we would want to do here is say, all right, um, the distance of PZ greater than your clip plane test, we'll start inside there, here's the result P, we don't care about the scale, because that doesn't actually happen, so this right here is our final P. And this is what we did to it, right? Uh, so I'm gonna un ignore this one part of it because I feel like this part we haven't settled on yet. Uh, so I'm gonna leave that out for now. Uh, and then we're gonna just do this part of it. So again, what we're trying to solve for here, uh, we're gonna try and solve for uh, what, the, what this input P is, this guy right here, right? So I'm just gonna kind of try and do these things roughly backwards, right? So if I wanna do these things roughly backwards, then what I would need to do is say, okay, uh, if we start out with this, and what I'm getting passed in uh, is this final P, then in order to do this step, I would wanna get this projected XY back. Uh, so the first thing I would do is subtract the screen center, like that. Uh, and then what the next thing I would do after that is I divide by meters to pixels, uh, and then I would have my projected x y, right? Uh, so that's my projected x y is x y. Um, then uh, I guess what I would do is say, okay, offset z. That's not actually a thing that we're using anymore. Like I said, we kind of got rid of that. Uh, we've got the distance above target, that stays exactly as it was. We've got the distance to, to PZ. The P dot Z is what we're actually solving for, right? Um, in this case, uh, and so we need to do that for our next step, uh, which is this thing. So in order to back solve for this, uh, we have the projected x, y, y here, and we need to force them back through this thing, right? Uh, so this is like sort of the next, this is the next step of it. This is like the, um, uh, I guess what we should call this is like uh, decentered. It's like the decentered or scaled. I don't know. I don't know what we'll call this. We'll just call this a dot x, y, right? Uh, and then here, when we get back to get back projected x, y, uh, and uh, right, that was something where we had uh, this, this raw x, y that was getting passed in here, which was the original p, right? We want to solve for that raw x, y. So what we want to do is, again, we want to move this stuff over. So we've got our projected x, y here, right, uh, which is going to be that, that a, x, y. We want to take this one over distance to p, z, we want to move that to the other side. So we want to divide by that, right? And dividing by a divide is, is going to be a multiply. Uh, and then we've got the, the focal length here. That's going to be a divide. So there's that familiar part again that we already had. And then here's the raw x, y uh, that we get passed in, right? Um, so basically, we don't need to know the near clip plane. We do need to know this. Uh, solving for the raw x, y there. Uh, yeah. That just gives us the pxy that we actually wanted. So this is our result x, y. Uh, 
Again, that's exactly what we had before. Um, but the, the tricky part here is this distance to PZ. So our distance to PZ, and, uh, and I suppose this part here, the final P, uh, this, is our, this is our input value, right? Um, the distance to PZ in that equation is distance of a target minus PZ, right? So this thing gets inserted in here. And we know the PZ, that's a given. We have a transfer of target, that's a given. Uh, so this is actually the entirety of it. And I feel like that sh should do it, right? Like that feels like it should be the, the, the long and short of it. <coughs> uh, at the end of it, <coughs> after all that, uh, I feel like all we have to do is inverse that sort of offset p part of it as well. So whatever the re result is, uh, that would actually get transformed by the offset p. Uh, and I feel like that that should have been it. But if I take a look at what that actually does, you know, the actual things that that does are the things that we already were doing, right? We divided by meters to pixels as a te you know in our test code, right? Um, we set the thing that we were passing in to be the distance above target minus the local PZ, and we have the offset and scale set to zero and one, so they're not in play. So I do not understand why that right there uh, did not successfully line up right like why does that not uh, successfully do sort of a symmetrically reversed operation you know what I'm saying because uh, I've kind of verified the logic to my satisfaction now and so I think that like again like I said there's something much more complicated uh, that we're just not accounting for. All right. Well, I think based on that, I would say, I still have some residual peanut butter here left over from the pre-stream. Uh, I would say that I'm not pleased with how janky that stuff is in there. And I feel like I don't want to be in a situation where I'm going to have to constantly be like looking through that stuff. Uh, so I feel like we would definitely want to go ahead and spend some time cleaning up uh, what's happening in that projection and just do some tests uh, where we can figure out like, okay, we can, oh, we, we have some like well-defined spaces. Here's like screen space. Here's, uh, you know, world space and the transform between them should work like no questions asked. Like that shouldn't be a thing uh, that we have to think about anymore. We should be able to debug that once and have it good. Uh, and it seemed like we sort of had something like that for doing the camera bounds. Uh, and uh, and I guess uh, for some reason, whatever that reason is, it's something is 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 amiss with how we're doing that calculation, uh, and it doesn't line up with the forward transform. If that makes sense. So I'm not sure again what that is. It's going to bug me, but we'll have to do that tomorrow. If that makes sense. Uh, so let's see. We will do a little Q&A anyways, even though we're sort of out of time. That's not really a big deal. Uh, so we can see if anyone had questions on that. Uh, maybe people already figured it out, but I don't know if they did or didn't. And yeah, there's always is, it does always seem like there's a lot of lag uh, between when when um, when I say things uh, and and when people in the chat can hear them. Uh, Conlongs, how will the focal length factor in? Will you have FOV stuff? Well, we we already do so. Um, 
you know, we did basically like uh, when you do this sort of thing, when you go kind of up, uh, up and down, the focal length determines like sort of how that transform happens, right? Because the focal length of a camera determines uh, what the Z, what the foreshortening actually is, um, like how rapidly that happens. So. So I, yeah, I feel like that's just, that's so annoying. I hate having a bug, uh, it, I don't know. So I don't like leaving it, but something pretty basic, pretty simple, like it's gonna be very simple in just the way that um, we're thinking this through is incorrect. And so, yeah. I do feel like if if Insobot had really gotten its its deep learning on, it would just have known the answer. It would be like, oh, hey guys, um, the bug is blah. Semi-related, what do you think about using different types for points and vectors? Um, I don't find it to be very useful. I find it to actually be kind of more of a pain. Um, because fundamentally speaking, point versus vector is not about storage, it's about usage, it's about like conceptualization. And there are plenty of times when you may wanna conceptualize something as two different things depending on the circumstance and now you're in this thing where you gotta like cast or convert and it's just annoying, you know. Does the screen center need to be involved? It was used in complete and project. So as far as I know, the mouse is already centered around. That's why I checked that before. So the mouse already is centered around the center of the screen. So that part didn't really need to happen. Um. Sarchi Pancakes is part of the problem that the code isn't normalizing the motion between the mouse and the entity relative to the screen dimensions in world coordinates at different levels. Um. So this transform in unproject is completely linear, right? It's just a series of multiplies. So it should not matter when we transform the mouse from pixels to meters. We should be able to do it before or after the unproject and there should be no change, right? Uh, and I guess, you know, since we're in bug land, we might as well verify this fact. I mean, that's what it looks like now. Uh, and if I was to change it to doing it after the fact, right, where we did a transform first uh, and then did the mirror to pixels, I should get the exact same result, right? And I do. Um, so, hey, math still works. So that's something. Um, but yeah, for whatever reason, um, we still have a problem in terms of how we're, we're doing that. Now, now, one thing I should look for that we didn't look for as well, right, is in push rect, uh, when we do get render into basis P, I'm assuming we use it directly. Yeah, we do. Uh, so we do use it directly. Uh, and then when I actually render it, uh, render into rectangle, draw rectangle, P, P entry dim. So it actually gets used right. I wanna make sure there wasn't any other transforms happening in there. Abner Coimbra says we have run out of questions. Well, I haven't run out of questions because I still have a question, which is what is the problem with this unproject? Right, and that's a pretty good question, I feel like. Um, 
I feel like that's the kind of question I would like to have someone answer. Uh, and I don't really know. Uh, I don't really know what the problem is. Because that, this, the distance above target minus PZ, so that's just going to end up being local Z, right? And so it's going to use 1 over local Z times the focal length times whatever we pumped through, what we're, we're asking it to do, right? And so... No other questions? Yeah, so the problem is, I think we should probably pick it up tomorrow because it's unbounded, right? It's like nobody has any idea what the bug actually is, so we have to kind of go through um, and, uh, and step through it and be kind of relatively meticulous about what we're doing uh, so we can see uh, what the situation is. <clears throat> uh, so, you know, I don't really know, unfortunately, I don't really know any, any simpler way to deal with it than that. Um, if we just do that quickly, uh, let's see here. If I just do that quickly, And you know, um, I should sort of make a meta point here because I feel like it's probably warranted. So this is the kind of bug that costs you time typically, right? We've kind of talked about some, some sort of programming like, I don't know, like attitude or whatever, or like the, you know, the programming sort of like the viewpoint of programming on Handmade Hero. And, you know, this is, this is kind of the disconnect, the fundamental disconnect I tend to have with most software engineering stuff. It's like, when you talk about languages or tools for programming, this is what costs me time a lot of times in terms of bugs. I don't tend to have a lot of bugs that are about me forgetting to free some memory or something, right? So like when people say, oh, we made this language and it's garbage collected, it's great or whatever, right? It's like, okay, you know, maybe that saves some time occasionally. It would probably save some time on Handmade Hero because I'm programming with no libraries at all. So I don't even have my own stuff that does like allocation or anything. So I have to write, you know, a linked list or whatever on Handmade Hero. But in practice, like who cares? That stuff I write it like once and it's fine, right? But stuff like this, because typically, you know, you write a lot of code like this, and even if you were using something, like let's say you, you know, you didn't have to worry about unproject in particular because you used somebody else's 3D engine or whatever. So, you know, you, you've, you could maybe take care of that with a library or, or however you were doing it uh, in your programming methodology, you didn't have to worry about that you still have the problem of you're going to write stuff like this in game code. Like you've got some things and you're trying to, you know, compute something between them and it's just, it comes out wrong and you're like, what happened, right? The t kind of stuff that I want in programming to make life easier is stuff that makes debugging things like this easier. Like I don't need something that makes debugging memory stuff easier because that doesn't ever happen. Like that's like such a rare occurrence. But stuff like this happens to me all the time. And so like you could imagine like if in Visual Studio you could just be like draw this out, like draw these vectors, like show them to me, right? So I can see them and I can see the steps of the equation and how it's going. It would probably be, it, we'd probably all 
instantly know what the problem was. But now, instead, when I gotta step through this, we're just looking at a bag of numbers that we can't even tell like what they are or what they're doing or why, right? Um, and so that's really the thing that's kind of frustrating is people always seem to be, they seem to work on these development tools that actually are for problems that I just don't have. Or problems that I can solve in a very short amount of time with not very much effort and very low stress, right? Uh, but then problems like this that are actually hard get completely neglected and you typically have no tools for them at all. And so the only thing that you could possibly hope for is if someone already wrote the code for something like this that you could then use. But assuming that you are trying to develop the code yourself, which is what you do if you're a programmer, so no matter what library you're using, you're gonna write something yourself, whatever that something is will have bugs like this and they're hard to find, right? Uh, and so that's really the thing where it's like you want this, you, you know, you want things that make this sort of stuff you know, trivial, like that you wouldn't really think, you wouldn't, you know, just be like, oh yeah, I immediately could see what the bug was and we were done, right? Um, so yeah, but anyway, if we just take a quick look at this, here's our mouse P, um, you know, that's what it is. I wanna be able to save this here. Of course, there's like no way to do notes in Visual Studio when you're debugging, because why would you be able to do that? So I gotta copy it into an actual text buffer. So there's the mouse P. Uh, that's what we're starting with, right? There it is. Uh, and so we convert it to meters mouse P, which is obviously a much smaller value. And there it is. Uh, and that seems sane, right? We were in this upper quadrant, I think. Uh, so that makes some sense. Right. We then take the local Z, which we already know is just a fixed constant of one, and we're going to unproject it. Right. Uh, so we come in here. We're at a fixed distance of one. So this is really just going to be one over the focal length. The focal length is 0 0.6. There's the projected x y. So here is uh, when we do that first unproject step. Right. Here's what we get. Okay. Uh, that comes back. I've now got my world mouse P. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into push rect uh, and I'm going to see what happens when we actually try to use this thing. Wow. Step into push rect, please. God. Such a. Uh. Okay. So inside push rect. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is, is make an offset here of this x, y value, and that's uh, because we're drawing something of a dimension. I suppose to make this a little bit easier on ourselves, we probably should have made this dimension be zero. And I guess, in fact, in this case, I probably can just do exactly that. I can just reach in here uh, and actually change these values uh, so that when we're doing this computation, uh, p remains the same, right? Uh, so when we do that computation, uh, we end up actually producing this value, right? So now our input value is exactly the same so that we're not draw even drawing a rectangle at all. We're just doing uh, this, okay? And we're passing in that z equals eight value and that's because we're trying to account for the distance uh, from target thing. Uh, and so if I take a look to at the transform itself, uh, the distance of a target was eight, and of course our z was one, so, so I'm sorry, it's nine, and our z was one, so that, that equals eight, which is what we would expect there. Ah, I meant to step into that. Let's try that one more time. Okay, uh, so here we are. Uh, here is our original P that's coming in, which is what we expected it to be. Uh, we're going to transform it, uh, presumably not at all, uh, so it should be exactly the same, uh, and it is. We're not in orthographic transform. Our distance above target is 9, so our distance to PZ... What? Okay. Oh. oh my 
my god. How many times are we going to forget about this, people? Uh, we took out we took out Z movement relative to the basis B. We took that out. Remember we decided we didn't want that and we took that out. So this whole thing was probably working just fine. There like never probably was a bug in it at all. Oh my God. So basically like all we really actually had to do was this. Hey, look at that. It's in exactly the right place. <sighs> well, at least it's good to have found it. Oh my God. Uh... <laughs> well, I hope you all saw what happened there. That was like by design. That was like closed by design. When that bug report came in, we would have been like, nope, that's how it's supposed to work. Because remember what we decided is we didn't want to do anything since it's this, this, this stupid two and a half D nonsense again. Uh, where you're like, don't use the offsets. Man, I think we should just go ahead and, and yeah, we, we got to like, we gotta figure out a better way to do the Z. That's so annoying. But we tried and we couldn't figure out like a good way to do sort of like the two and a half D offset thing, but that was all it was. We don't use the Z, so you pass in a Z, doesn't matter what it is, it's not gonna work. Lame. That is lame, dude. That is super lame. That is lame, lame, lame stuff. To say the very least. All right, chat. Did everyone understand that? What happened there? Hopefully everyone understood that. So yeah, unsurprisingly, the bug was somewhere that we weren't expecting it, uh, which is, uh, yeah. I mean, if I had looked closer, I would have seen that. But I never looked at that. That right there is the thing. And again, like I said, it was actually a feature that we implemented. But I forgot that's how we did it. Um, that's how we wanted to do it. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's interesting. I think that's the first time on Handmade Hero I can remember getting bitten by a feature where we were like, "Oh, yeah, that's how it's supposed to work." Mm. This two and a half D nonsense is so annoying, but I'm really not sure what's a better option. Right? I mean, it's just, that's just kind of the way it is. It's just kind of how that stuff goes, man. 
you know. All right. Well, so surprise, there was no bug, but we were too dumb to know that. And so the bug was was us. We were the bug. What are you going to do? Well, tomorrow we'll go ahead and finish what I actually well, I guess not tomorrow because we're off tomorrow, but Thursday we will go ahead and finish that. Uh, what should have been relatively simple and what probably would have worked if we had remembered how our actual renderer works, which we don't, but that's fine. All right, folks, the bug was us. I will see you guys uh, on Thursday for some more Handmade Hero uh, when we will go ahead and finish what I actually wanted to do. Uh, and uh, yeah, and there you have it. So someone on the stream was asking if this bug would have happened if you used a library. The answer is yes, apparently, because if the library was spec to work the way our stuff worked, uh, we would have had the exact same problem because we would not have known that that's how they did things because we forgot, apparently, even if we had read the documentation and read about it, uh, and then we would have made the same mistake. Oops. It happens sometimes. At least we found it. That's the important part. Uh, but it would be nice to maybe figure out some way to make it a little more intuitive how those things work. Uh, because in 2.5D, right, it's like, I just wonder if there's some way of, of more cleanly specifying 2.5D things in a way that we could, you know, that we wouldn't really forget. Uh, like it would be very clear from like the structure of it what it meant. I don't know. But anyway, if you'd like to play around with this sort of stuff at home, uh, you can certainly go to handmadehero.org. Uh, the source code comes with the game if you pre-order it. So you can check that out if you want to. If you want to try finding some of these features on your own, you can certainly do that. Uh, but otherwise, that's all for today. Uh, you can, as always, support us on Patreon if you'd like to. You can go to the forums to ask questions if you would like to. You can also look at the annotated episode guide. Uh, you can check out the tweet bot, which tweets the schedule. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think that's just about it. Uh, until... Next time, which I guess will this, this week will be Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific Daylight Time. Have fun programming, guys, and I will see you on the internet. Take it easy.